This video was recorded on June 22nd, 2022 and has been edited for viewing. Okay, it's two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so hello and welcome to the Oregon Department of Education Child Nutrition Programs webinar on administrative oversight of the Child and Adult Care Food Program. This webinar is part of a series of technical assistance trainings that we are providing to CACFP sponsors. It is also the second part of our annual training that is required for all CACFP food program coordinators and authorized representatives. CACFP administrative oversight responsibilities applies to all types of CACFP sponsors, whether they be child care centers, Head Starts, sponsors of family daycare homes, school food authorities, after school at risk sponsors, emergency shelter programs, or homeless programs. My name is Dee Dee Pointer, and I will be your MC for today. Darcy Miller will be your chat and QA host, and she will be tracking any questions you ask through the chat for our QA session at the end. For all attendees, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat if you have not done so already. Please share your name and the name of your organization that you work for. While you all are doing that, we'll go ahead and um, have our amazing presenters introduce themselves. So I'll hand it over to them. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Murray, and I am the Finance and Audit Specialist on the Community Team. Hello, everyone. My name is Eliza Kondo, and I am a Child Nutrition Specialist on the Community Team. Hi hey everyone, my name is Shannon Smith, and I am also a child nutrition specialist on the community team. Great, thanks everyone. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at what they will be presenting to us today. So first I'll go ahead and go over our learning objectives for this training. Then Teresa will go over our administrative oversight and VCA or viability, capability, and accountability. Eliza will then go over the role of the management plan, which will be required for all sponsors starting with the fiscal year 2023 renewal application, including school food authorities. After that, Shannon will walk you through the CMP web management plan. And finally, we will have time for some Q&As with Darcy. As you think of questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box and send it to everybody or to Darcy Miller directly. Darcy will be tracking the questions and we'll have time to go over the questions at the end of the session. If we do not get to your questions today, your assigned specialist will contact you after the webinar. Here are our three learning objectives that we hope you will leave with today. We hope you will know what administrative oversight is and how VCA is used to maintain effective oversight of the CACFP. You will understand the role of the management plan in CMP Web. And finally, you will be able to complete a management plan to accurately reflect the organization's administrative oversight plan. Hand it over to Teresa and she'll now walk you through an overview of administrative oversight and VCA. Thank you, Didi. Good afternoon, everyone. In this part of the webinar, I am going to focus on administrative oversight, what it is, why it is important, and how it is connected to the state agency agreement, the performance standards, the CACP management plan, and key CACP staff roles and responsibilities. I'm also going to share why it is important to ensure administrative oversight is maintained and how effective administrative oversight will help ensure compliance with program requirements and minimize the chance of a seriously deficient finding. Before we go further, we're gonna take a poll, but we'll use the chat box to do the poll. Here's the question. My organization is familiar with what administrative oversight is and how to document that it is in practice. Is this statement true for your organization or false for your organization? Please feel free to answer honestly. These polls are not being documented and this information is helpful for ODE, CNP to understand our sponsoring organization's familiarity with administrative oversight requirements. I'll give you a few minutes and then I'll come back and see what that consensus is. Okay, I know you're still answering, but it looks like the majority of you have answered and you are familiar with how to document administrative oversight. And that's great because today's webinar will be a refresher for you. And for those of you that are not familiar or unsure, then that's okay because that's what we're gonna cover today in our webinar. 
So let's start with what administrative oversight is. DACFP administrative oversight is the process of planning, organizing, and managing all aspects of CACP operations. Administrative oversight is a program requirement, and it is in place to ensure that all components of the CACP are operated with integrity, accountability, and in compliance with regulations. It is a continual process that requires sponsors to assess the effectiveness of systems and internal controls in place, to verify accurate and reliable operations and record keeping are in place, and to proactively identify and correct areas of non-compliance. Before we go further, I think it's important to clarify what is meant by the term program sponsor or sponsoring organization. The term that ODE CNP uses specifically when speaking of a school food authority, a local education agency, a tribe, a governmental or public organization, a not-for-profit or a for-profit organization that signs and holds agreements with ODE CNP to operate the child nutrition programs. You will hear us refer to sponsors throughout the presentation. When we do, we are referring to the organization that holds the agreement with ODE to operate the CACFP. Please note, the information in this webinar applies to all sponsor types, as all CACP sponsors, including school food authorities, will be required to complete a management plan in CMP Web as part of the fiscal year 2023 CACP renewal application. Okay, let's talk about the CACP state agency sponsor agreement, which identifies the requirement of administrative oversight and is a starting point for operating the CACFP. The Child and Adult Care Food Program is a federally funded program that provides payments for eligible meals served to program participants. Sponsoring <laughs> organizations enter into agreements with the state agency, making the sponsor the ultimate responsible party for ensuring that all requirements of the agreement are met, including to assume final administrative and financial responsibility of the CACFP. Also as part of the agreement, the state agency has responsibilities. The state agency must provide sufficient consultative, technical, and supervisory assistance to sponsoring organizations to ensure effective program operations, to monitor progress towards achieving program goals and ensure compliance with all yes. civil rights. Agreements. So you may be wondering, what is meant by administrative and financial responsibility? Assuming administrative and financial responsibility means being accountable for and taking responsibility for the management of the CACFP to ensure it is operated in compliance with all program, federal, and state regulations. This includes all aspects of operating the CACFP, from completing the program application, ensuring menus meet meal pattern requirements, training current and new administrative and operational staff, conducting monitoring and oversight of monitoring, financial and program record keeping, managing any changes to the program sites, civil rights compliance, validating and submitting claims for reimbursement, reimbursing homes for meals served, and tracking the use of federal funds. The acceptance to assume final administrative and financial responsibility of the CACP is administrative oversight. Okay, now let's discuss the performance standards. As I previously mentioned, administrative oversight involves the management of all required elements of administering the CACFP to ensure it is operated in compliance with all program, federal, and state regulations. Seven CFR 226.6 B27 requires all sponsoring organizations to comply with the performance standards. Performance standards outline expectations for sponsoring organizations' administration of the CACFP, which are financial viability, administrative capability, and program accountability, commonly referred to as VCA, or viability, capability, and accountability. In order to ensure administrative oversight of the CACFP, sponsoring organizations must document they are financially viable, Administri administratively capable of operating the CACFP and have internal controls in place to ensure accountability. Most of you will remember we've discussed the CAC performance standards during several trainings in the past, including the fiscal year 2020 CACFP annual training, and more recently, the financial management webinar in April of this year. Since this topic has been covered previously, I am only going to provide a high level review today but it is important to understand that the performance standards are a key requirement for CACFP administrative oversight. Darcy will put a link to the financial management webinar recording in the chat box. So why are the performance standards so important? It's to ensure program integrity, that sponsoring organizations are qualified and capable of operating the CACFP. Additionally, 
Programs that meet the CAC performance standards are more likely to be well run and successful with CACFP. Lastly, sponsor success with the performance standards is often determined by the strength of their internal controls, including written CACFP policies and procedures. Now let's take a closer look at the three performance standards in more detail. The first performance standard is financial viability. Sponsors must demonstrate that they are a financially viable organization to participate in CACFP. Organizations must expend and account for all program funds in accordance with regulations. Here are regulatory citations and guidance which govern this first performance standard. Okay, let's move on to our second performance standard, administrative capability. To demonstrate administrative capability, the management practices of a sponsor must be appropriate and effective to ensure that operations are in accordance with CACP regulations. Sponsors can do this by having an adequate number of qualified and trained staff, ensuring the effective operation of the center or site, employing sufficient staff to manage the requirements of the program, for example, multi-site sponsors, ensuring there's enough monitors to meet the ratio of monitors to facilities, and sponsors must have program policies and procedures in writing making sure that program responsibilities and duties are assigned and ensuring compliance with USDA Child Nutrition Program civil rights requirements. The final performance standard of VCA is program accountability. As a means of ensuring fiscal accountability and program compliance, an organization must have controls and management systems in place. To do this, sponsors will need to maintain documentation showing that Nonprofit organizations that are not school districts are governed by an independent board of directors, that there is fiscal accountability, meaning funds are properly safeguarded and used, records are maintained in all required CACP areas and available for review during administrative reviews and audits, operational requirements such as training and monitoring are being met, and meal pattern, meal service, claims, and other operational requirements are in compliance. So an easy way to remember the CACP performance standards is VCA, performance standard one, financial viability, performance standard two, administrative capability, and performance standard three, program accountability. Okay, now let's move on and discuss the CACFP management plan and why it is so important. The CACFP management plan is a tool specifically designed for sponsoring organizations to document how their organization will manage the CACFP. More specifically, it's a structure for CACFP sponsoring organizations to document that they have accurate and effective written policies and procedures in place to operate the program in accordance with the performance standards. The CACP management plan is important because it connects the organization's vision for the CACP administration to all required meal service operations. It documents the organization's ability to provide compliant administrative and operating services. It details how the CACP performance standards are met, and it's a vehicle to obtain approval from the state agency to participate in the CACFP. Let's review the components of administrative oversight, which are administrative responsibilities, administrative duties, and management systems. Administrative responsibilities are broad and involve all aspects of planning, organizing, and managing the food service under the CACFP. They are the basis for identifying all program requirements and determining the specific policies and procedures necessary to ensure that the CACP is administered adequately. Administrative duties are the specific activities that must be completed to effectively operate the CACP. They include, but are not limited to, completing the program application and updates, ensuring menus meet meal pattern requirements, training current and new administrative and operational staff, conducting monitoring and oversight of monitoring, financial and program record keeping, managing any changes to the program sites, civil rights compliance, validating and submitting claims for reimbursement, reimbursing homes for meals served, and tracking the use of federal funds. In order to achieve and maintain administrative oversight, sponsors must have effective management systems in place to ensure the program operates in accordance with all CACFP requirements. Okay, now let's talk about key CACP staff and their roles and responsibilities in providing administrative oversight of the CACFP. These are staff who are responsible for the administration of the CACFP, who have key CACP administrative duties, 
and have a role in the oversight of the CACFP to ensure it is operated in accordance with regulations. ODE CNP needs to know the duties completed by the key staff at your organization. This information will be entered in CN the, into the CNP web management plan each year. Based on the structure of your organization, you may have multiple staff who complete different CACFP duties, but there are four very important roles for CACFP, the authorized representative, the food program coordinator, the financial office contact, and the claim contact. These four roles are reported to ODE CNP in CNP web located on the sponsor information sheet. Let's start with the authorized representative. This must be someone who has oversight of how the CACFP is run at all of your sites. They must have signatory authority, meaning that they can sign agreements on behalf of the organization and enter into contract with ODE and any other vendor relationships you may have. Depending on your organization structure and how large it is, the day-to-day -day involvement in CACFP duties may be minimal to intense. No matter the level of involvement day-to-day, -day, the authorized representative is someone who has the last say in how CACFP is run. In a way, the authorized representative is like the captain of the ship. They are the ones pointing the direction of your organization and where it will go for CACFP. Some common CACFP tasks of authorized representatives include training staff, having financial oversight of CACFP spending, and the development of policies and procedures related to CACFP. Common job titles we see listed include executive director, CEO, superintendents, presidents, and owners. Next, let's look at an equally important role, which is the food program coordinator role. Many of you might be food program coordinators and your role is to be the main representative of your organization to ODE CNP. The food program coordinator is the main sponsor contact with ODE with the ODE CNP specialist and should be the person who coordinates most day-to-day -day CACP operations. The CACP duties may also vary based on the size of your organization and your organization structure. Some typical CACP duties of food program coordinators include overall management of the CACP, training, menu development, monitoring, procurement, and data entry. Common job titles can include nutrition manager, program coordinator, and food service supervisor. Job titles do vary and your job title does not have to match with one of these listed. Now let's look at the role of the financial office contact. This staff will be one who provides financial oversight of CACP reimbursements and manages the nonprofit food service account with these funds. The financial office contact provides financial oversight in your organization, and they're usually involved with the development of any financial policies and procedures related to CACP, such as handling receipts, tracking of staff hours worked, and approval of mileage reimbursements. Sometimes these tasks are outsourced to a contracted bookkeeper, in which case, the position that is responsible for providing financial information to that outside bookkeeper should be listed as the financial office contact. We will talk a little bit more about allowable contracted services later. Some common job titles include chief financial officer, business manager, accounting manager, and fiscal analyst. Finally, we have the claim contact. This person submits claims in CNP Web each month. They may have additional CACP duties, but that will vary by your organization structure. In many organizations, the claim contact is often either the food program coordinator or the financial office contact as well. It is okay to have one staff member take on multiple duties. However, you want to make sure there is segregation of duties and cross-training among staff to ensure there is adequate staff for administrative oversight. Some common job titles include accounting technician, administrative assistant, and fiscal manager, in addition to all the job titles you've seen with the food program coordinator and the financial office contacts. Okay, lastly, let's discuss the board of directors. All nonprofit organizations that are not school districts are governed by an independent board of directors. Independent in this case refers to someone whose livelihood is independent from and who holds no personal fiscal interest in the organization's activities and who are not related to each other or to its personnel. The board is the governing body of the organization and as such is responsible for setting policy, regularly reviewing programs of the organization, providing fiscal guidance and review of program budgets, and providing ongoing governance. It has the authority to hire and fire the executive director. Since the board of directors has a role in administrative oversight of the CACFP, they must be identified in CNP web. The board chair and contact information is identified on the sponsor information sheet in CNP. Additionally, all board members and information about their position and relationship with the organizational staff members and or each other must be identified on the management plan. 
Now that we have covered the typical CACP job duties for these four positions and the board, you might be wondering, why do they need to be listed in CNP web in the sponsor information sheet and the management plan? The reason they must be listed is because they are considered responsible principals. Responsible principals are ultimately responsible for CACP management and oversight. Together, these roles determine the integrity of your program and whether it is meeting all regulatory requirements. These are serious responsibilities and your organization should consider the staff for these roles very carefully. If regulatory requirements are not met, these staff will be responsible for addressing findings and making corrective actions to stay on the program. Okay, it's time for another poll question and please use the chat. True or false, all CACP duties and responsibilities must be completed by the staff identified as responsible principals. I'll give you a few moments to consider your answer and then I'll be back. Okay, we're getting a lot of results and a lot of answers. Thank you for participating. And it looks like you all are correct. If you chose false, that is the correct answer. And the reason is responsible principals are responsible for the management and oversight of the CACFP, and they will complete some CACFP administrative duties, but they are not responsible for completing all CACFP tasks, duties, or responsibilities. As responsible principals, they must ensure that staff with CACP duties and responsibilities are well trained and the CACP is operated with integrity and in compliance with regulations. Okay, we've talked about CACP staff and board member roles in providing administrative oversight, but we haven't discussed the roles of third party vendors. Some CACP sponsoring organizations may choose to contract out some required program activities in the administration of the CACP. Should sponsors retain the services of a third party to perform one or more program activity, they are still required to retain oversight of the work performed and accept final administrative and financial responsibility for the work performed by the contractor, including repayment of any funds due to noncompliance. Securing contracted services requires following appropriate procurement requirements and submitting a copy of the signed contract to ODE CNP for review and approval. If a sponsoring organization enters into a contract, they are responsible for monitoring and ensuring adherence to the contract. This is also referred to as managing the contract. So please note, administrative oversight and management may not be contracted out, but some administrative program activities may. Remember the conditions of the state agency sponsor agreement we reviewed earlier. By signing the agreement, sponsoring organizations assume final administrative and financial responsibility of the CACFP, which means even if some program activities are contracted to a third party, the responsibility to maintain administrative oversight and management of the program remains with the sponsor. Now let's discuss what program duties and activities may and may not be contracted out. Allowable contracted administrative program activities include hiring an outside bookkeeper to record financial transactions of CACFP, contracting with a food service management company to prepare and serve CACFP meals, and contracting with a nutritionist or registered dietitian for consultation and menu reviews. There are some administrative program activities that sponsors may not contract out. These are preparing application materials, completing site monitoring, responding to corrective actions, and submitting claims. This is important, so I will repeat this information. Sponsors may not contract out the management of the program. Should sponsors choose to retain the services of a contractor, to perform one or more program activity, they are required to retain oversight of the work performed and accept final administrative and financial responsibility of the work performed by the contractor. This requirement is in place for all sponsoring organizations, regardless of sponsor type, public or private nonprofit organizations, for-profit organizations, school food authorities, tribal and government agencies. The responsibility for administrative oversight remains with the organization that entered into the CACFP agreement. And ODE developed a training for school food authorities on the responsibilities of each party when contracting with the food service management company. And Darcy will place a link to this training in the chat for all of you. Okay, throughout this part of the presentation, we have discussed what administrative oversight is, how it's tied to the performance standards and the management plan, the importance of identifying key CACFP staff and their roles as responsible principals, and we've identified administrative activities that may and may not be contracted to a third party. And hopefully all this information has helped explain why administrative oversight is so important. 
Effective administrative oversight ensures that sponsoring organizations manage the CACP program with integrity, accountability, and in compliance with regulations. It allows sponsoring organizations to assess systems and internal controls in place, to verify if accurate and reliable operations and record keeping are in place, and to proactively identify and correct areas of non-compliance as needed. I cannot state enough the importance of documenting and maintaining compliance with administrative oversight, which leads to our last topic. At application, renewal, and during administrative reviews, ODE CNP will evaluate sponsoring organizations' compliance with administrative oversight. This is completed by reviewing the management plan to evaluate and determine if sponsoring organizations have accurate and effective written policies and procedures in place to operate the program in accordance with the performance standards. It is essential that sponsoring organizations demonstrate that written CACP policies and procedures are put into practice. The policies and procedures must state what will be done, who will do it, and how it will be done. Program and financial record keeping documentation must support the practice in place. More simply stated, do what you say and say what you do to avoid findings for a lack of administrative oversight. If during the administrative review, ODE CNP identifies that a sponsor does not have adequate administrative oversight over the CACFP, as written policies and procedures identified in the management plan are not being followed, which results in missing or inadequate documentation to support the collection, completion, and maintenance of CACP program and financial records, the sponsor would have multiple findings in the areas of record keeping, including maintaining complete menu records, documenting point of mail service, and supporting nonprofits food service was met. The sponsor would be found seriously deficient in the program and administration due to inadequate administrative oversight. The responsible principles would be identified in the report and would be responsible for developing corrective actions to address the program findings and maintain program compliance. The key to preventing a serious deficiency finding for inadequate administrative oversight is to ensure that staff identified as responsible principals understand their roles and are well trained, that all required CACP administrative activities are identified and included in written policies and procedures, and that actual practices in place are in alignment with the written procedures. The serious deficiency process is a regulatory requirement and is designed to assist sponsoring organizations with identifying frequent or severe noncompliance developing corrective actions, and preventing reoccurring noncompliance. Okay, let's review what we've discussed. Administrative oversight requires sponsoring organizations to assume final administrative and financial responsibility of the CACP by operating the program in accordance with all applicable program, federal, and state regulations. To ensure adequate administrative oversight of the CACP, sponsoring organizations must document they are financially viable, administrate capable of operating the CACP and have internal controls in place to ensure accountability. The key CACP staff roles identified in CNP web, along with the board of directors are responsible principals of the CACP and must be well-trained to ensure the integrity of the program and is operated within regulatory requirements. Some administrative activities may be contracted out, but if this is the case, administrative oversight still remains with the sponsoring organization as sponsoring organizations may not contract out the management of the program, and sponsoring organizations that are unable to demonstrate that written policies and procedures identified in the management plan are being followed may be at risk of being determined seriously deficient in program administration due to an inadequate administrative oversight. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I know that was a lot of information to take in, and now I'm going to turn it over to Eliza, who will discuss the role and purpose of the management plan. Thank you, Teresa. That was a lot of really great information. Before we start discussing management plans, let's do a quick poll question. So go ahead and put your answers in the chat. My organization has a management plan and is up to date with current information. Is that statement true for your organization, false for your organization, and are you not sure? I'm seeing answers rolling in already. So thanks everyone for participating. These answers are not being tracked through our polls here. So thank you for your honesty and continuing honesty with these polls. I'll give you a few more moments to get your answers in. All right, it looks like we had a pretty good mix and a lot of trues in there. So 
you know, our goal for today for this webinar is to help clarify the question, any questions you may have and get you ready to change that answer to true if it is not already true. So thank you again, everyone for participating. So the management plan is a summary of your organization's written policies and procedures. It's your guide that demonstrates your sponsoring organization's ability to manage CACFP operations and meet the CACFP performance standards that Teresa just covered for us. It is important to remember that the management plan contains details and a high level overview of your written policies and procedures and is not meant to replace your organization's written policies and procedures. Federal regulation requires all new CACFP sponsors and renewing CACFP sponsors to complete a management plan. As Dee Dee mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, beginning this year, ODE CMP will be requiring all sponsors, including school food authorities, which are school districts or other organizations operating the school nutrition programs to complete a management plan with their CACFP renewal application annually. These federal regulations require the management plan to include detailed information on your organization's management and administrative structure, a description of the staff assigned to program monitoring, details regarding CACFP administrative earnings and expenses, and the procedures used by your organization to administer the CACFP program. Now let's take a look more into the purpose of the management plan. Why do you need to complete one? What's the goal? The management plan is meant to demonstrate the ability to fulfill your responsibilities as a sponsoring organization. It's meant to document your organization's written policies and procedures and to show your compliance with the CACFP regulations, including the performance standards. The management plan supports achieving the purposes just mentioned by connecting your organization's vision for the administration of CACFP to all required meal service operations. As the responsible parties and individuals, you have a vision of how you'd like to, the CACFP to operate within your organization. The management plan helps put by putting your vision into action through implementation of the program day to day. It details the CACFP performance standards. The management plan allows you to have clear details on how the CACFP performance standards are being supported in your organization. Completing the management plan allows you to evaluate your organization's viability, capability, and accountability. Since your management plan is a snapshot of your written policies and procedures, reviewing and updating the management plan on a regular basis allows your organization and ODE CMP to evaluate the current plan in place and ensure it upholds the CACFP performance standards. The management plan also documents your organization's ability to provide compliant administrative and operating services of the CACFP. When creating and reviewing your management plan, you have the opportunity and responsibility to ensure all policies and procedures that are in place are in line with current CACFP regulations. And lastly, the management plan allows your organization to obtain and maintain approval to participate in CACFP. As I mentioned earlier, it is federal regulation that new and renewing sponsors complete a management plan with their application. As I've mentioned, the management plan is used to document accurate and effective policies and procedures that are evaluated during administrative reviews to determine if a sponsoring organization is in compliance with regulations. To ensure that the plan is clear and provides sufficient detail, it's encouraged to answer the who, what, when, where, and how when developing your policies and procedures and your management plan. Let's talk about each of those a little bit more. The who in the management plan is meant to answer who in your organization is responsible for performing and providing oversight of the specific function or activity. When referring to the management plan, it should be clear which positions are responsible for the specific CACFP functions. When listing who is responsible for the specific functions, you should be listing the specific position or title and not a person's name. This allows for clarity of who is responsible for this function regardless of any staff turnover that may occur. The what is meant to describe what the element, function, or activity is. The what should also provide step-by-step -step procedures that a person can easily follow 
and clearly follow when reviewing the management plan. The when should detail when the function or activity is performed. This detail can depend highly on the function or activity you are referring to within the management plan. For example, the when for taking point of service meal counts will differ greatly than the when for submitting a monthly claim for reimbursement. Both are important in ensuring that they happen at a very specific time. However, they differ greatly on when the specific function must occur. The where should develop should provide a detailed location where records related to the policy and procedure will be stored. These details allow any staff who have a role in the procedure or management plan to know where to access required documents if needed. And lastly is the how. This is how you will monitor the function or activity to ensure it is implemented and followed in accordance with policies and procedures. This last piece is extremely important in ensuring you have administrative oversight of the CACFP. Management plans and policies and procedures are only helpful to your organization if they are followed accurately and reviewed and updated frequently. The management plan must include details on the following components. The management and organizational structure, including details on the governing board. If your organization has a governing board, describe the, roles, um, the role of the board and oversight of the CACFP. The organizational structure by providing details on staff positions and assigning CACFP duties and responsibilities. Financial management by describing how your organization will operate the CACFP in accordance to the regulations that Teresa listed out for us at the beginning of this webinar. And an outside employment policy, which details an effective outside employment policy and procedure. It will also include details on monitoring requirements, such as sufficient qualified staff, ensuring that your organization has an adequate number of knowledgeable and trained staff that meet staffing standards and monitoring visit requirements. A tracking system to ensure that all site monitoring required timeframes are being met throughout the year. And a record keeping system to maintain all required CACFP monitor monitoring documents for all site monitoring conducted. And information on the administrative requirements and operations, including eligibility and enrollment, so you're ensuring that accurate classification and verifying enrollment of participants. Meal pattern compliance to verify the creditable meal service prior to claim submission. Validation of claim data to evaluate claim records prior to claim submission. Remember, as the sponsoring organization, you are certifying that each claim submitted is true and correct. And a record keeping system to ensure all required CACFP documentation is maintained for the required three years plus the current fiscal year. Please note that the outside employment policies and monitoring requirements information will only be found in your management plan if you are a multi-site sponsor, which is a child nutrition program sponsor with more than one CACFP approved site. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Shannon, who'll take a deeper dive into these components and the management plan that you will see in CMP Web. Thanks, Eliza. So now that Teresa has explained in detail what administrative oversight means, and Eliza has gone over the importance of the management plan and supporting policies and procedures, I'm going to walk you through what this management plan actually looks like in CMP Web. First, let's go over a few important notes. Multi-site sponsors have additional sections in the management plan, which are not included on the management plan for single site sponsors. The management plan is a reflection of the practices currently in place within your organization. Items contained within the management plan should match information submitted in the other CMP web information sheets. Sponsors are expected to have separate written policies and procedures. The methods and functions selected in the management plan should match what is in those written procedures. It's important to point out the CMP web management plan is a living document and sponsors must update at any time circumstances change within their organization. The information here, as well as within the sponsor and site info sheets should always reflect what is currently in practice at your organization. Lastly, the management plan has recently been updated. As we go through this next section, you might notice some slight differences compared to the last management plan you completed. 
All changes are minor, and I will touch on the updates as we go through this next section. Also, if you're a school district and you haven't yet completed a management plan in CMP Web, you will do so under fiscal year 2023 during CACFP renewals. Okay, let's jump into our walkthrough of the management plan in CMP Web. So part one is going to gather contact information for the contact person for the management plan. Whoever completes and submits the management plan must be listed on lines one through six here. This person must be the authorized representative or food program coordinator listed in the sponsor information sheet. You may notice that number seven is no longer here. Uh, one of the changes that was made to the management plan is that line number seven, which was the sponsor Dunn's number, was removed. The federal government is no longer using the Dunn's number to identify federal awards, and it has been replaced with the unique entity ID or UEI, and it's now being collected on the back end of CMP Web. Below the contact person section, you will see the non discrimination statement section. This slide shows only a small part of the statement. You will see the entire long statement in the management plan in CMP Web. You must check yes to acknowledge, but no other information is entered here. The outside employment policy is only included on the management plan for multi site sponsors. There are two questions here, and there is only the option to select yes, as these are both program requirements. No employee with CACFP responsibilities shall have other employment that interferes with the completion of those CACFP duties. Additionally, any employment outside of CACFP will not constitute a real or apparent conflict of interest with CACFP. Here are a couple examples of scenarios that could be a real or apparent conflict of interest with outside employment. Scenario number one, uh, a sponsor or a site, site monitor has a personal business where they sell a product like maybe Avon or Sensi, and they promote or sell those products to other staff members during work hours while they're monitoring a site under their supervision. This would be considered a conflict of interest. Another example would be a food program coordinator whose family owns and operates a farm stand and the food program coordinator purchases all the produce there for their centers. This could be a conflict of interest. Part two of the management plan is related to financial viability and financial management. The first two questions in this section are related to a description of need and recruitment. Performance standard number one states that new sponsors must demonstrate that their participation will help ensure the delivery of program benefits to otherwise unserved facilities or participants, and that renewing sponsors will use appropriate practices for renewing for recruiting facilities. Does your organization intend to recruit new facilities or sites this fiscal year? If so, are they currently on CACFP? The next couple of questions relate to the fiscal resources and financial history. Here, you'll describe what type of funds your organization has access to in case of a temporary interruption of funding, such as a government shutdown or problem with the state payment system. If you're required to submit a budget, this section must match Schedule A on the approved Excel budget. Still in the financial section, in this next question, you will describe how CACFP funds would be repaid due to an overclaim. At the very least, all sponsors must select to withhold future monthly reimbursement, which is the easiest way for ODE and the sponsor, as well as sponsor discretionary funds. Discretionary funds are the sponsor's unrestricted funds that are available to cover costs that are not reimbursed by the CACFP claim payment. If your organization has any other type of funds, check other and describe the available funds in the section below. The last question here is whether or not you have a waiting list at one or more of your facilities. Next, we'll move on to part three, which focuses on administrative capability. 
all sponsors must have a separation of duties to ensure accountability and accuracy, which will be reflected here. The authorized representative and food program coordinator as responsible principals must have duties listed in this section. As you complete this section, keep in mind that positions or titles must be listed, not staff names. If there is a double check or backup position for a function, use the forward slash between the two titles to indicate two different roles. An example is listed here on the slide. The functions listed here are not applicable to all program types. If it doesn't apply to your organization, enter NA under the staff position and title field. All lines must be completed. Some examples of functions that may not apply are Line 31, site monitoring, is only applicable to multi-site sponsors. And lines 40 through 42 regarding confidential income statements, child and adult enrollment forms, and the OMER are not applicable to at-risk, homeless, or emergency shelter sponsors. Lines 43 through 46 are new additions to the management plan. Uh, lines 43 and 44 are applicable to all sponsors. Lines 45 is only applicable to for-profit sponsors and line 46 is only applicable to pricing program sponsors. Lastly, it's important that the positions and titles listed here correspond with the information submitted in the sponsor info sheet and the budget if applicable. For example, if the food program coordinator's title is food service manager on the sponsor information sheet, you would list food service manager under the CACFP functions here that they're responsible for. Similarly, food service manager must also match the positions and title listed in the budget if applicable. Next, we'll move on to site monitoring. Site monitoring is required for multi-site sponsors, so this will not appear on the management plan for single-site sponsors. Federal regulations require that sponsors employ sufficient staff to ensure that there is at least one full-time equivalent employee, or FTE, for every 25 to 150 centers or sites. This table will determine how many FTE your organization must have. The information here must match what is listed in the other CMP web information sheets as well as the budget. And we'll take a few minutes to walk through it line by line as it can be a little tricky. The gray areas you see are automatically populated based off of your site info sheets. On line 48 is the number of site monitoring reviews per year. This is the total reviews per year that your organization must complete. Note that all sponsor types must have three site monitoring visits per fiscal year. To determine the total number of visits, you will multiply the number of CACFP sites you have by the number of reviews required per site per year, which is three. For example, a sponsor has five sites. Each will get three visits per year, so 15 would be entered on this line. Next, on line 49, is the number of operating months per fiscal year. This must match the information in the site info sheets and the budget. Line 51 is the estimated site monitoring staff hours per month. This pertains to site monitoring duties only and includes prep for site monitoring, traveling or distance between locations, time it takes to complete a site monitoring visit, etc. Line 52 is the estimated average time per month spent on child enrollment forms. This number will be zero for at-risk, homeless, and adult care programs, which do not have the enrollment form requirement. Line 53 is only applicable if you plan to add new sites this fiscal year. This is the estimated hours for new site pre-approval and follow-up. Once you've filled in all of these lines, the total number of FTE is automatically calculated and shows on line 54. The number here must be equal to or greater than the required monitoring FTE line located on the summary page of the Excel budget. If it is not, you'll need to revise lines 51 and 52 so that it does meet that requirement. 
In the next question, you'll describe your organization's procedure for permanently correcting any CACFP findings or serious deficiencies that are found during monitoring visits. It is required to address the process for both findings and serious deficiencies. If the same process is used for both, you can just state that here. Also, include the title and position of the person who will conduct any training required as a result of the finding or serious deficiency, as well as the method used for training and a description of the documentation. Lastly, on line 56, describe the backup plan that ensures sites are monitored in the event that the monitoring staff is unavailable to perform their duties. The staff listed here must match the positions and titles listed in line 31 of the management plan, which is that section on CACFP functions. Moving on to part four, which is program accountability. This is the biggest section of the management plan and it's broken down into five smaller sections. The first section we'll look at is the governing board of directors. A board of directors is a requirement for all nonprofit organizations, excluding school food authorities or school districts, higher education public institutions or colleges and univers universities, and some municipal entities, such as City of Portland, for example. A nonprofit board in the state of Oregon must have a minimum of three members. This section won't be applicable to all program types. If it is not applicable, you can just leave it blank. The board of directors listed here must reflect the current board and match what is listed on the organization's website. Organizations must disclose relationships within the board in the right-hand column, if any. The board president or chair listed in the management plan must match the information in lines 78 and 79 of the sponsor information sheet. If you need to add more lines to include all of your board members, click the Add Lines button at the bottom. Alternatively, if your current board has fewer members than the previous year, please ensure that you delete the information in the entire row, including the drop down button. Otherwise, the sheet will error out. The next section is Fiscal Accountability, which covers both integrity and accountability for all funds and property received, held, and dispersed. The first question reads, does the institution have a bank account? This is a requirement of CACFB. Next, what documentation is maintained on file to support CACFP expenditures? Check all that apply. Some of this documentation is required while others are as applicable. This should match what is described in your separate written policy and procedure for CACFP expenditure documentation. Itemized receipts, invoices and bills, bank records, procurement documentation, and balance sheets are all required. Timesheets and payroll records are required only if staff time is charged to CACFP. If rental agreement, cost allocation plans or indirect cost rate is entered under other, these must also be on the approved budget. Line 64, board minutes, is required to be checked for all nonprofit sponsors, excluding school food authorities, higher education public institutions, and some large municipal entities. Sponsors' nonprofit boards must demonstrate adequate administrative and financial oversight of the CACFP, and this must be documented in their board minutes. The last question on this slide is how frequently are CACFP receipts and expenditures validated against the budget? Daily, weekly, monthly, or other? Remember, anytime you select other, you must enter the description below. Next, we'll look at what methods are used to consolidate and submit claims for reimbursement before the claim deadline and ensuring only eligible meals are claimed. While you should have several different methods selected, only select those that are required for your program type. Items selected should match your written policy and procedure for submitting an accurate meal claim. 
line 73 if checked, then make sure more than one staff position is listed on lines 27 through 46 of the management plan, which is the section on CACFP functions. Line 75, the one month enrollment report must be checked if your organization is required to have an OMER. Line 85, this line has just been added to the management plan. This is applicable to and required of for-profit sponsors only. For multi-site sponsors only, the next two questions are asking if all sites are affiliated with your organization. If not, does your institution disperse reimbursement to those facilities within five working days? The answer to line 88 must match the answer to the same question located on the sponsor information sheet. Moving on, we'll look at what methods are used to ensure that CACFP funds are used in accordance with FNS Instruction 796-2 Revision 4. Once again, only check those that are applicable to your program. Methods checked here should also match what is described in your financial management policy and procedure. If cost allocation plans on line 91 is checked, cost allocations must be on the approved budget. Line 92, which states only costs included in the annual budget are charged to CACFP is required and must be checked. Next, what systems of safeguards and controls are in place to prevent and detect improper financial activities by employees? While these are all best practices, remember to only select those that your organization has in place and which are included in your separate financial management written procedure. Some methods listed here may not be applicable to your organization type. Line 102, annual single audits are performed, must be selected if an organization expends more than $750,000 in federal funds a year. Note, single audits were previously called A133 audits. Lines 103 and 104 must be checked if an organization has a board. And lastly, uh, the next question, fiscal accountability in the fiscal accountability section is, does the institution have a written procurement procedure that follows applicable federal regulations? The answer here must be yes. Having a written procurement procedure is a requirement for all sponsors. The next section under program accountability is record keeping. In this section, you will select where these different types of documentation are kept, either at a central office or at the site. These systems and documentations are not applicable to all sponsor types, so if it doesn't apply to your organization, you'll select not applicable. If your organization is a single site sponsor and the central office is the same location as the site, you may choose either central office or site for the applicable records, but make sure that you're consistent in your selection for all document types. If you have separate locations for your central office and your site, but you keep records at both locations, again, just pick one response for consistency. Here are some examples of document types that may not be applicable to your organization. Confidential income statements are not applicable to at-risk, homeless, and emergency shelters. Child and or adult enrollment forms are not applicable to at-risk, homeless, and emergency shelters. Infant feeding forms are not applicable to sponsors that do not have children under one year old in care. And site monitoring reports are not applicable for single site sponsors. Next, on line 125, you will describe where previous year's documents will be stored. If you store those records at a central location or an offsite storage facility, then list the address here. If the documents are all stored on site, describe where on site they can be found. For example, storage cabinet and food program coordinator's office. From here, we move on to CACFP training. First, what methods are used to address ongoing CACFP staff training needs 
and to communicate CACFP changes or institution policies and procedures to appropriate staff. All of these methods listed here are fantastic, but remember to ensure you only select those that your organization has in place and those that are included in your written training policy. Line 129, site monitoring and technical assistance must be selected for multi-site sponsors. All sponsors must select other on line 135 and then use line 136 to describe the resources used for ongoing training of staff, such as ODE materials, organization prepared materials, et cetera, and how training is documented, such as a certific certification form, signed agenda, et cetera. Then in the next question, you'll describe the method used to train new employees on CACFP duties. Again, use the other box to describe the resources used for training new staff and how that training is documented. The next question states, describe how you will address a change in the food program coordinator position. In other words, if the current food program coordinator resigned or was out of the office unexpectedly, how would that change be addressed within your organization? Your description should include at a minimum notifying ODE CMP, updating the CMP web sponsor information form and management plan, giving user access to CMP web and training. If there's currently a backup to the food program coordinator, include the backup position and title and how they're prepared for duties. The last question in the training section asks you to characterize your employee turnover rate. Next, we'll move on to meal service. What methods are used to ensure meals meet the meal patterns? It is best practice to have all of these selected, but remember only select those methods that are actually in practice at your organization. The methods select selected must also be included in your procedure for ensuring meal pattern compliance. Finally, the last section on the management plan is civil rights. What methods are used to ensure that the facility complies with civil rights requirements? To ensure compliance with civil rights, all of these items must be selected and in practice. If other is selected, make sure you include the description below. ODECMP has a couple of important updates regarding civil rights that I wanted to bring to your attention. On May 11th, ODE sent an email to all sponsors that outlined a recent USDA memo regarding an update to the discrimination complaint process. This guidance was effective immediately and requires action from sponsors within 90 days, which includes civil rights trainings must be revised, the long version of the non-discrimination statement must be revised, and the and justice for all posters will be updated and distributed to sponsors when available. On June 13th, USDA released a Q&A update regarding the racial and ethnic data collection. This update provides clarifications on questions related to the collection of race and ethnicity data by visual observation and identification in CACFP and SFSP policy rescission memorandum that USDA released on May 17th of 2021. Both of these USDA memos, as well as the ODE CMP emails are either currently available or will be available soon on the ODE CMP, CACFP memos, news and regulations webpage. Darcy will put a link to that page in the chat. Moving on, the last question here is, how does the institution provide current information and eligibility requirements for WIC participation to parents and guardians of enrolled children? Check those that apply. Note that this is not applicable for adult care centers or at-risk centers as they are not required to provide WIC information to participants. So for those sponsors, this section can be left blank. The final step is to certify and submit the management plan. By submitting this form, you are certifying that the information on the management plan is true and correct. Reminder, the person who submits the management plan must be the contact person listed on lines one through six of the management plan. 
When you're ready, you will click Save at the bottom of the page. If the plan goes into error status, you'll need to review and complete or correct the information and then click Save again. The management plan will go into pending submission status once it's been fully completed. As we wrap up our review of the management plan in CMP Web, here are a few key points that we want you to remember. The management plan is a tool specifically designed for sponsors to summarize how they will manage CACFP. It provides a structure for sponsors to document that they have accurate and effective written policies and procedures to operate CACFP in accordance with the performance standards. It connects the sponsor's vision for the administration of CACFP to all required meal service operations. It provides you, the sponsor, with a guide to follow to help ensure continuity of service and operational fidelity of the CACFP. Lastly, it allows the state agency to review and approve the sponsor's plan to operate the CACFP in accordance to regulation and with administrative oversight. All right, now I'm going to pass it back over to Eliza, who will walk us through some additional scenarios and resources. Thank you, Shannon, for walking us through the management plan in CMP Web. I know that was a lot of information, everyone, so thanks for sticking with us. We're going to do a few scenarios and poll questions now. The first question is, your organization has had a change in staffing and now has a new food program coordinator. Due to this change, the management plan contact in CMP Web must be updated with new contact information. Your authorized representative logs into CMP Web and updates the management plan contact to the new food program coordinator's information and submits the form for ODE CMP to review on behalf of the food program coordinator. Is this allowable? Yes, no, or not sure. Go ahead and put your answers in the chat. Seeing a lot of answers come in already. Thank you all for participating. All right, I am seeing a lot of yeses come in. So the correct answer is actually no, it is not allowable. And this is because the management contact plan listed in lines one through six of the management plan in CMP web must be the one to certify and submit the management plan for ODE CMP to review. This is because the management plan contact is responsible for ensuring that the management plan is true and correct and must certify this information when submitting to ODE CMP for approval. Don't worry about getting that answer wrong, everyone. Thank you for participating, and I appreciate your honesty, and that's what we're here for, right? So hopefully you learned something new, and we can ensure that that doesn't happen when you submit your management plan. All right. Our next poll question. So for this one, we're gonna refer to an example sponsors part three of the management plan. This is the section where sponsors detail out the separation of duties with C within CACFP that Shannon detailed out for us earlier. I'm gonna give you a quick second to go ahead and look at the image on the slide and answer the poll if you think yes, all titles are listed correctly or no, if you think there are errors in the position lines. Lots of answers rolling in. Thank you all. Great job, everyone. So for those of you who answered no, you are correct. So for a quick bonus question for all of you who went and answered no in the chat, if you can answer into the chat, what are some of the errors that you noticed on this image? The errors shown in this example are some of the most common errors that ODE CMP sees when reviewing management plans. Lots of examples are coming in. Great job, everyone. Great job. So everything I'm seeing is great. So for those of you who put your answers in the chat, um, some of the errors shown on this management plan um, that you all did a really great job of pointing out are, um, the finance director, Sally, has her name listed and only the position title should be listed in that line. 
The second error is that lines with multiple staff positions listed are separated with commas instead of a forward slash. And lastly, lines were left blank. If the function is applicable to the organization, a staff position or title must be listed. And if the function is not applicable to the organization, an A must be entered into the title line instead. Great job, everyone. Thank you all for participating. So we're gonna take a brief look at a resource available to you regarding administrative oversight of the CACFP. If you registered for this webinar in advance, you received this resource prior to the webinar. And this is a quick reference guide and it was developed to provide you with a high level overview of the CACFP performance standards of financial viability, administrative capability, and program accountability that Teresa detailed out at the beginning of the webinar. The second page of the quick reference guide is meant to assist you when developing and maintaining your management plan and your written policies and procedures. For those of you who may have registered in advance, um, you have received this already. And if you have not yet received the guide, Darcy will put the link in, to the document in the chat box now. Dee Dee, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Great, thank you, Eliza. Um, and thank you, Teresa and Shannon as well. Um, so now we'll take some time to answer questions that have come in both during registration for this webinar, webinar uh, as well as the questions that you all have been putting into the chat while we've been presenting. Um, so as a reminder, if you have any questions on what has been presented today, please submit your questions into the chat to everyone and we'll do our best to answer them in the time we have left. All right, so we'll go ahead and hand it over to Darcy to run our Q&A session. Thanks, Dee Dee. Here's our first question. Does CACFP documentation ever have to be hard copy or is digital or electronic always okay? Teresa, would you mind answering this question for us, please? No, I'd be happy to. The answer is yes, digital or electronic versions of CACFP documents are always okay. For many years now, USDA and CACFP have allowed sponsors to maintain solely electronic files. In fact, that, that's what ODECMP does. However, there are some requirements for all required CACP documentation, whether hard copy or electronic. And they are that records must be the original source document. An original source document is the original document that contains the details of a business transactions. For instance, if a meal count is recorded on paper manually, then that document is the source document. It may be scanned and maintained electronically, but that image is the source document. Also, records must be legible and complete, so electronic documents must show the original source document clearly and its entirety. And records must be readily available for review should USDA or ODCNP or some other government agency request them. This means electronic files will need to be available to those staff with a need to know or who are covering for the food program coordinator or other um, responsible CACP individual. And confidential information must only be accessible by staff with a need to know. For instance, if confidential income statements are maintained on your network, they must be only accessible to staff who have a need to know. They cannot be available to all staff with access to your organization's network. And lastly, if a solely electronic documentation system is used, if that's your method, you'll need to have a robust backup system in place should the computer malfunction or crash. Back to you, Darcy. Thanks, Teresa. Our next question is, what is the best method for sponsor CACFP key staff to communicate with their nonprofit board of directors about CACFP requirements? Eliza, would you please answer this question for us? Sure thing, thanks Darcy. So the answer to this question is specific to each organization. Large and small nonprofit organizations may have very different methods of communicating important and required CACFP information to their nonprofit board of directors. In general, here's the recommendations ODECMP suggests. If you haven't already done so, set a time to get, give a high level overview of CACFP operations and financials to your board. Be sure to include that your organization has a written CACFP agreement to operate CACFP in accordance with regulations and the board of directors must have administrative oversight over the agreement and CACFP operations. Each year, nonprofit boards must approve the CACFP budget, and in doing so, they approve expenditures prior to purchases being made. Talk to the board chair and ensure that a time for a CACFP update is on the regular board meeting agenda. 
It's up to your organization to do what fits best with your board. However, it's vital that your board have current information on CACFP operations and financials and know they have a responsibility to provide oversight for the CACFP. If something arises related to CACFP between board meetings, establish a protocol to update your board via phone call or email. Examples may include an announced or unannounced CACFP administrative review, a major decision like adding or dropping sites on the CACFP agreement, or notification of a received complaint. The nonprofit board of directors plays an important and vital role in CACFP operations. Be sure they know their CACFP responsibilities and are kept up to date on CACFP operations. Back to you, Darcy. Thanks, Eliza. Our last question, which was submitted prior to the webinar, is I'm new to the food program coordinator position. What do I need to know and do? to ensure my organization has adequate administrative oversight. Shannon, would you answer this question for us, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. When you're new to the CACFP food program coordinator position, it can be a little overwhelming to figure out what you need to know and do. Here are some to-do items for you to start off with in this situation. First, connect with your ODE CMP assigned community nutrition specialist. If CMP Web is not updated to reflect you are new in the position, it's vital to connect with ODE CMP so that we can help your organization and you transition to your new role. As you settle into the food program coordinator role, should you have any questions, be sure to contact your assigned specialist. We're always happy to help. If you are not also the authorized representative, be sure to connect with the authorized rep and any additional responsible principals in your organization to get a little history and perspective on the position. Review all chapters in the CACFP Policy and Procedure Manual, which apply to your organization. Review trainings listed on the ODE CNP CACFP Training Center website. Be sure you have access to CMP Web, and then review the information within CMP Web and ensure it's correct. If it's not, you'll need to revise it. Review your organization's written CACFP policies and procedures. Are these policies and procedures current and accurate, or are there some missing? If not current, they'll need to be revised to reflect actual operations. If they are missing, you'll need to collaborate with any other key CACFP staff in your organization to get them written and then implemented. Darcy will now put a link to the CACFP main webpage in the chat. From there, you can find the CACFP Policy and Procedure Manual, the CACFP Training Center page, and a link to CMP Web. This year, ODE CMP is holding webinars just like this one on key topics requiring written procedures. Check out ODE CMP's Training Center page for postings of these webinar recordings if you've missed one. We have several more to go this year, so be watching for the CACFP Knowing and Growing newsletter for the continued announcements. Here are the topics that we're covering this year. Claiming procedures, financial management procedures, and procurement procedures. These webinars have already taken place and the recordings are posted online. Administrative oversight procedures, that's this webinar, and this recording will be posted in the next couple weeks. Menu and meal pattern procedures happening August 17th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. and the registration is open now. Lastly, the one month enrollment report or OMR procedure. The date of this webinar will be announced soon, but it will be sometime in September of 2022. Please note the OMR session does not apply to at-risk programs or emergency or homeless shelter programs. Darcy has put the link to the CACFP Training Center webpage in the chat. From there, you can find both the registration links and recordings of the past technical assistance webinars. Back to you, Darcy. Thanks, Shannon. Now it is time to answer some of the questions in the chat box from today's session. If you have questions, please place them in the chat box now. Questions which are global in nature and apply to all sponsors will answer first. If you have a sponsor specific question, go ahead and put it in the chat box. However, we may 
have your assigned specialist contact you directly regarding it. For questions that apply to all sponsors, we'll answer as many as we, of them as we can today. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will be sure to follow up with you individually after the webinar. Now, we're going to take a few minutes and converse amongst our staff and review the questions submitted. This is going to take a minute or two of silence, so hang in there with us and we will be right back. We do want to take this opportunity to remind you that ODE CMP sends out a monthly newsletter called Knowing and Growing. This newsletter will include all new memos that were released in the past month, in addition to information on available grants, trainings, and important deadlines. This is sent out each month to all the responsible principals listed in your CMP web sponsor info sheet, and information in this newsletter must be reviewed by the responsible principals. Memo updates and program updates are required information for sponsors to know, while additional grant information and resources are helpful to review. If you are not on the list and you want to receive the newsletter, you can sign up by using the link on this slide, um, and Darcy will also share that in the chat box for you all. Before we end our session, here's a short message from the Oregon Department of Education. ODE supports equity and excellence for every learner and seeks to work with school districts, education service districts, and community partners like you. We believe all children should have access to a high quality, well-rounded learning experience. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. And that is our presentation for today. So thank you all for joining us. Um, that wraps up our administrative oversight of the CACFP training, and we hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.